Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the next episode. I'm not really sure what number this is going to be because I don't have internet right now, so I'm not sure when it's going to um, get uploaded. But nevertheless, we are doing a podcast today from Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Um, I'm at Direct Commission Course um, with the Army, and I have an awesome guest His name is Captain Durham, and uh, he's got some pretty cool stuff for you guys. He's an entomologist here in the Army, and he's also a doctor of plant medicine uh, in the civilian world. So um, before we get to that, I'm really excited for you guys to hear that. I also have an insight for you right now, um, and it comes from Andy Fox in Greensboro, North Carolina. And he said this is a, a quote that his grandfather used to tell him, and it's called, You can't ride two horses if you only got one ass, which means... You know, you can only do or you can only take one path uh, in this life. So really, like, make the most of it. And um, I think that really resonates with me, and I'm sure it resonates with a lot of you as well. Um, Just, you know, put all your effort into something that you really think you're going to enjoy and make the most of it. Um, So without further wait, um, I'm going to get Captain Durham on the show, and I'll introduce you guys to him in a second. So stay tuned. Welcome to Insights of All Trades with Cole and Nick. This is where we talk to people we meet along our journeys through medicine, military service, sports, education, and beyond. We hope you enjoy. All right, Captain Durham, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you for coming. Um, so right now, Captain Durham and I, uh, Captain Durham and I are both doing um, some training with the Army, and we're in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Um, so no internet access really, but I'm going to get this uploaded once I get home. Um, so that's when you all will be seeing it. Um, so first of all, you know, how are you like in Oklahoma? Well, it's a bit of a change from what I'm accustomed to in, in Virginia. Uh, the sun is much more intense than I had anticipated. It got yeah. sunburned as many of us did that first week. Yep. Um, bone dry, alternating with severe... <laughs> High relative humidity. Yeah. It's it, it's hard to peg Fort Sill yeah. in terms of its weather and the climate. Yeah, so yesterday we did the ACFT, which is the Army Combat Fitness Test. Correct. Which is going to be the new Army um, fitness um, test for the whole, the whole branch. And uh, we did it yesterday at like 9 in the morning maybe. Oh, we got out there. there at 10 after 7. And we were basically raring to go, but apparently there was a miscommunication. Yeah. And we were supposed to do just kind of PRTs and stretching, mm-hmm. et cetera. So when did we actually start? I would say we probably started about 8.30. But we were out there okay. for a while. Okay. <clears throat> but um, so the events go, okay, so it starts out with a deadlift. Then um, the, the over-the-head yeah, p- throw, medicine ball. Medicine throw. ball. So 10-pound yeah. med ball, equally weight distributed. Yeah. Right. And then after that is the push-ups? Is the it? push-ups. The hand-release uh, yes, push-ups. Hand-release push-ups. Correct. <laughs> and then um, sprint drag carry. Sprint drag carry. Which that consists of a shuttle sprint, so it's 50 meters each, right? I think it's 25, 25 down each back, way. So. Right. So 50 total. Okay. So 50-meter right. sprint. Um, 50 meter sled drag. The drag, is, which is 90 pounds, yep. so two 45 pound weights. Right, and basically. then, and then a lateral, 50. Correct. Meter, well, 25 down and back. Right. And then. Then the kettleballs. Yep. Kettleballs. Two 45 pound <laughs> kettleballs, as I recall, in each hand. Yep. And then you finish with a sprint. Right. So. Right. As they like to point out, by the end of that that last sprint, you kind of lose dorsiflexion in your feet. And um, so that was something we were looking out for because when we were practicing for it, one of our colleagues actually ended up tripping because of that. But, um, okay, so we do the sprint drag carry, and then after that is the leg tucks, right? The leg tucks. So you're hanging on a bar, and you have to bring your legs up. Your knees basically have to touch your elbows. Their elbows. And then by the time we finally got to the last event, which was the two-mile, that was... It probably was like 9.30 or something. It probably, thereabouts. Which sounds early-ish, but with the temperature here... But in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, <laughs> yeah. there are no guarantees. Yeah, so it was... It, I looked at my phone when we got back at the weather app, and it said like 110, like real feel. Heat index. Yeah, heat index right. or whatever. Right. <clears throat> um, it was oppressively hot. Yeah. And, and, and people were bowing out of the run exactly, because yeah. of that. So we, yeah. were, we were the second platoon to go... 
out of four platoons. Um, and then there was also like a fifth straggler group, basically. Carryover. From, yeah. yeah. They can only accommodate 64 at a time, right. apparently. Most platoons were like 73 to 76. Mm-hmm. So we got lucky with our timing, if you want to call it lucky. but <laughs> I'd use that term loosely. Yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, that's what we just did yesterday. And now we're at the library in Fort Sill. We booked out a room to do this podcast. So kind of in recovery mode. There's only a few days left of this DCC direct commissioning course. Yep. So... Yep. Off to uh, bigger and better things, hopefully. <laughs> I'm just going to take it easy, hopefully. Okay, yeah. <laughs> For at least a week or two. So let's talk to let's talk about like how you ended up getting here in the first place. Like, what's sure. your life story that led you to DCC in Fort Sill, Oklahoma? Oh God, life story in a nutshell. <laughs> Good Lord. Oh, you got all the time you want. <laughs> so basically, I was born and raised on a, a farm, a vegetable farm, on Long Island, New York. And you hear vegetable farm and Long Island, New York. Those don't seem to jive no, it necessarily. Yeah. It seems like a, a direct contradiction of terms, right? But interestingly, Long Island still has, I believe it's 30,000 acres, still in active agricultural production. Yeah, so I didn't realize how big Long Island actually is. Is yeah, it like 118 it's, miles? It, yeah, it's like, like roughly 120 by 30 yeah. miles wide, so, give yeah. or take. I guess it, yeah, I never knew that. I always just thought it was like another part of New York City almost. I don't like I don't know where that came it, it from. It is but... often seen as kind of an outgrowth okay. of New York City. Yeah. So and much of it of course is very urbanized. Uh-huh. But if you yeah. go out all the way out east. This so is where I'm, you were? Actually no, okay. surprisingly. So I'm I'm in Suffolk County, which is the count the easternmost county. And most of our area is still it, it well, suburban but turning urban increasingly. Okay. So we're kind of the lone holdout in our immediate neck of the woods that is still farming okay. commercially. There are a couple of small little like community farm outfits, but I don't mm-hmm. tend to consider them yeah. commercial operations. Really, if you want to hit the ag belt of Long Island, you got to drive probably a good 30 minutes east. Okay. So Riverhead area, those of you who are from Long Island and New York would probably get where that is. You can visualize that in your okay, mind. Yeah. But the, the kind of the North Fork of Long Island, Okay. if you look at a Google map, it's still very agricultural. You can actually make out discrete farmers' fields. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Which is quite yeah. interesting, <laughs> yeah. And a lot of that is used starting, to be... Sorry, is it starting to like get swallowed up by the urbanization? It or? is, okay. it, it, progressively, and, and that's been happening for, for decades. Right. And, a lot of the, the local politicos have kind of seen that, mm. and they've tried to nip that in the bud as best they can. So we have, of course, farmland preservation programs, um, you know, purchase of development rights, transfer of development rights, just basically mechanisms to keep this open space open in perpetuity. Okay. That's the whole idea. And yeah. that's actually how my farm has kind of weathered the, the next intergenerational transfer. So my grandfather used to run it, okay. and he passed the reins over to basically my cousin, my my uncle and my mom wanted no part of it, really. <laughs> yeah. So it went ultimately to my grandfather's nephew, who was my first cousin once removed. It's convoluted. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's weird. But this, the farm's still running. And farm's still running. Okay. Um, I assume they're probably harvesting lettuce right now as we speak. Wow, nice. Most likely. Yeah. Among other things, root crops and cabbages, kales, okay. et cetera. We've kind of yeah. diversified. Is it a pretty uh, pretty hard work? It's pretty hard work. Um, surprisingly, we're actually getting more free time here at DCC. Oh, wow. Interestingly, actually get the majority of the weekends off on pass, but... On the farm, no, I'd routinely work months without a day off. Wow. Might might get you know half a Sunday off. Interesting. But that's that's about it. What about in the winter time? What what happens there? So we kind of maybe shutter operations is too strong of a term, but that's basically more geared towards tractor maintenance okay. and, and working on uh, cold frames. I don't know if your audience is familiar okay. with cold frames. They're basically kind of semi dug out areas and you use them as kind of makeshift greenhouses in a oh, sense. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, I'm not familiar and with that. And you just kind of all. top them off with with like double paned windows with plastic etc and that more or less oh. kind of maintains the heat. And oh. you could start things kind of in the midst of winter time okay. in these cold frames, these kind of in-ground little mini greenhouses of sorts. Wow, that's interesting. And then we transplant them out. Yeah. Wow, very cool. So, okay, so you 
You worked on this farm as a as a kid, is it right? Since I was about 10, Okay. I'd say. Yeah, I kind of got initiated into it because I was just sitting on my rear end. And yeah. My mom said, you need to do something. So I got <laughs> I got into this, this vocation of sorts. Yeah. And it turns out I really liked it. And I decided that's what I wanted to do as a livelihood. Just not necessarily as a farmer, yeah. per se. Okay. But more on the, the teaching and education and outreach side. Okay. So yeah. you think that sparked you to pursuing – you got a doctorate in plant in, science, is that right? Well, I got a oh, bachelor's in just plant sciences, okay. general plant Bachel- sciences okay. from Cornell University gotcha. in New York after wow. transferring in from just a local community college. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's kind of unfortunate my community college scrapped their ag program like oh. three, four years after I graduated. Bummer. But that's that's kind of symptomatic of you know a bigger issue with with agriculture. There yeah. just wasn't the enrollment to justify it, unfortunately. Hmm. But luckily, I got through yeah. and transferred up to Cornell and got my my BS again in just general plant sciences. Okay, and that was more or less an open curriculum, so I had free reign to take whatever I wanted. Yeah, and and apply it. Okay, to yeah. the actual real world conditions of a farm. Hmm. So, so how, what's that look like actually applying that? Um. Most of it deals with you know, pesticide calculations, fertilizer calculations, okay. fertilizer formulations, hmm. things like that. And, and just you know, general identification of pests, um, diseases, etc. Hmm. And you know, a lot of the kind of like, almost like the rogues gallery that you typically experience, you know what you're going to get year in, year out in terms of pests and diseases. Okay. But it's just a matter of correctly identifying those those symptoms or those actual critters in the field mm-hmm. and then just developing a strategy to maintain and or to contain I should say them okay yeah so it's, it's pretty straightforward and that ties in your other line of work which is why you're in the army right correct yeah. at least indirectly indirectly okay yeah so yeah basically once once I graduated got my bachelor's I worked for a cooperative extension for a okay. little bit. Yeah. And okay. are you familiar with cooperative extension? Yeah, my extension? dad used to work for oh, a cooperative did. extension. Oh, he did. Was he an agent? No, he was, uh, I actually, so he's going to kill me for this. I actually don't know exactly what he did. <laughs> so I know he taught classes there. Okay, um, okay. And he, he did a lot of um, collaboration with 4-H and various oh, other programs okay. with the youth in our area. Right, right. Um, so he was probably the youth agent, I would surmise. That sounds right. Okay, okay. <laughs> don't hold me to it. <laughs> so, you know, for your audience, if they don't know what extension is, it's, it's cooperative extension. It's basically kind of an outgrowth of the, the land-grant institutions. And when I say land-grant, I mean universities that were expressly basically founded to provide – not only technical expertise, but generating knowledge and disseminating mm-hmm. knowledge about agriculture and other things that were, at least at the time, probably more mission critical yeah. than, than now necessarily, right? We were much more entrenched in our agricultural agrarian lifestyle yeah. back in the day. So basically you have all these these teams of professors generating all this data, doing all this research, but then it needs to be translated to the end user, the farmer. Mm-hmm. The farmer is not going to necessarily appreciate what these these academics in the ivory yeah, tower these peer reviewed these peer reviewed <laughs> yeah. studies that they don't know how to make heads or tails of that necessarily right. and that's not to demean the farmer it's just they're speaking two different languages yeah, in essence exactly. so you need a kind of a lingual translator in the middle mm-hmm. and that's where cooperative extension fits in so they take that they apply it they present it to the farmer and say, you know, this is a new practice. This is an up-and-coming new crop that you might want to try, and these are the reasons why. And they often do on-farm trials. Hmm, okay. To say, hey, this is this is not just kind of an abstract concept that works just in the lab. This you could roll out in your field. Yeah. At your farm. So is that what you were doing then? So I was doing that for a little bit, for uh, about two years. It was about two years. And is this mostly vegetable farms? This was more on the vegetable potato side. Okay. Right. Interesting. Right. And is this all, where, what, what area is this? So this is Long Island still. Long Island still. This okay. is Long Island still, gotcha. believe it or not. Yep. I, I actually started with, it was basically kind of the structural IPM program. Okay. So IPM standing for integrated pest management. So kind of a toolbox of best practices to manage more household type pests. Okay. And that was for about a year, but then I transitioned into more the the vegetable potato 
program, kind of a lateral yeah. transfer into something okay. a little bit more relevant to what what I had been doing okay. historically. Right. So where's your where's your path take you from there? From the, you said a couple years with with CE. So that was a couple years with extension, and then in 2004 I went to New Zealand for a year, mm. and that was through a, a Rotary Foundation ambassadorial scholarship. Okay. So if you've ever heard of like a Fulbright scholarship, okay, yeah, it's kind of designed similarly. Okay. Just kind of building goodwill between nations, mm -hmm. et cetera. So I basically went to New Zealand for, it was just shy of a year in 2004, to kind of gauge the the pulse of the public when it came to genetically modified organisms. Ah. That was kind of a hot button issue yeah. at the time. Yeah. Okay. That's something I want to get into then on the podcast. So, Should we dive down on that rabbit hole now? You can dive down that <laughs> rabbit hole now if you'd like. All right. Feel free. So there's definitely some controversies out there right surrounding GMOs and there's people that have their own opinions on it right right, right. so what's your take on it and I mean I, I've been following genetically modified organisms GMOs basically since their initial release back in well 1994 was technically the first release okay. but it wasn't really rolled out wide scale until 1996 okay do you know what organism that was? Like, what, what did they work with first? So it was basically corn and corn. soybeans were kind of the big ones. Okay. And it's, it's broadened a little bit. You know, a, a lot of the public seems to think that all of their crops are genetically modified. Mm -hmm. And again, that's, that's kind of a nebulous phrase. What does it mean to be genetically modified? Does conventional breeding and selection qualify as, as a GMO? You would think, right? <laughs> and I would argue, yes, it does. But Uncle Sam says otherwise, okay. that the label GMO is specific to basically any sort of what's called recombinant techniques okay. or methods. So literally cutting and pasting a gene of interest, right? from one organism into another. Okay. And yeah. basically the, the donor gene, that, that species, is typically not even remotely related to the recipient species. So you're taking like bacterial genes mm. and inserting them into plants, et cetera. So not even in the same kingdom necessarily. Right. And I think this is where a lot of the, the apprehension among the public kind of arises yeah. from. And, you know, I understand that to a point. But if you look at it, I mean, in, in terms of horizontal gene transfer events, so there's kind of vertical gene transfer, which is like parent to offspring, okay. just kind of conventional sexual reproduction, sure. right? Okay. right? We are kind of a composite of our mothers and fathers. Mm -hmm. But you also have so-called horizontal gene transfer events, which is basically would be like me, the equivalent of me physically coming up to you and touching you and saying, here you go, have some genetic material. Yeah. It's all yours. Okay. Right? Yeah. And that that happens naturally in nature. It, through bacteria, mostly, through, right? through bacteria, through viruses. I mean, a lot yeah. of our genome, we have basically remnants of kind of viral mm. invasion events for all intents and purposes that wow. have just been kind of left behind in our genome. Okay. Can you think of any examples of that or just it's too widespread? It's too widespread. Like I mean, a lot of our genome is kind of vestigial. Wow. It's just leftover past events. And it, it doesn't necessarily do anything for us. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're kind of pseudo genes, which okay. means they're kind of, they're, they're abbreviated. Okay. So that they're not fully functional and they're just kind of in our genome. So could these maybe be things that are like uh, the introns that get spliced out or not necessarily? I believe introns are a different ballgame. Okay. But right. you're on yeah. the right. So you have All exons right. and introns, yeah. right? Introns get spliced out typically. Mm -hmm. So post, you know, mRNA yeah. production, et cetera. Um, but when we talk about, you know, kind of the, the integrity of a species, right? And people think species are immutable. That's not really the case. These vertical or, excuse me, horizontal gene transfer events take place quite frequently. Okay. I mean, there's a case just recently. They, scientists found kind of residual uh, bacterial genes in sweet potato. Wow. And this, this event, they actually kind of backdated when they thought this occurred. And this was well in advance 
of any human mediated huh, okay. gene transfer. So clearly this happened organically, mm. pun intended, yeah. in nature. I mean, heck, also that there are cases of I might get the the order switched in this case. I believe it was caterpillar genes that were found in basically a, a stinging insect. Wow. Okay. So how the heck that happened? So does that have to is unclear. Yeah. So what way? So could that only happen through like viruses? It and it might have been one another, exactly. It okay. might have involved an intermediary like a virus. I'd yeah. have to look at the paper again. But so clearly it wasn't a sexual yeah, transfer because right. they're just not sexually compatible. Mm -hmm. But there was some middleman that facilitated that gene transfer. Yeah. And this happens. This is totally natural. The whole model for genetic transformation that we use today is based on a, a natural model that occurs in the wild. Right, okay. So you have agrobacterium tumefaciens. It, so it's a bacterium, obviously, that causes a, a condition called crown gall in plants. Okay. And crown gall, it just looks like kind of this big tumorous mass, more okay, or less, on a, growing on, plant? on, plant, on okay. the plant itself. So that's how you know it's been infected with mm. this bacterium. And that, that mass is basically essentially kind of reprogrammed, rewritten plant tissue. Ah, the bacteria okay. directs the plant to kind of rewrite its genome and in turn turns the plant into a glorified factory for making specific metabolic compounds of that are advantageous, of course, to the bacterium. Okay. Wow. Yeah, Weird stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so what we do then, we, we've, we've observed this, right, in nature, and we say, okay, well, let's use this as kind of an inspirational launch pad and we can kind of selectively cut out the genes that cause this crown gall condition and just use the bacteria itself, the agrobacterium, as a vector, mm -hmm. as a delivery mechanism to deliver genes of interest that we are interested in, that actually agronomically, so like field conditions, help improve the crop in some yeah. capacity, okay. be it nutritionally, be it you know, herbicide tolerance, or the ability to make its own built-in pesticide. Wow. That's totally biodegradable. Yeah. So really interesting stuff. That is interesting but stuff. But people don't understand the subtleties yeah. of all this. And you just hear GMO and you just, GMO, Frankenfoods, yeah. yada, yada. You don't right? want anything to do it. <laughs> right, right. So I, I think we have to be mindful of the the degree or lack thereof of kind of scientific literacy yeah. among the public. And again, this is not to bash the public necessarily. They mm -hmm. just haven't had the opportunity to get the full story, to resolve sure. the whole picture. Yeah, makes and sense. And that's kind of where outreach comes. Okay. Into play. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So you did, so you were doing this outreach, um, cooperative extension stuff. Yep. We're going to go back yep. to the timeline. Sorry. Um, and that's for a few years. And then where, where's your path go? So then the, the New Zealand thing, like the we New talked Zealand, about. Right. Right. Yep, right. And then while I'm trying to think of the timeline, it was actually in 2003, before I went to New Zealand, I had attended a, an IPM conference, so again, Integrated Pest Management, kind of best practices for managing diseases and pests. I seem to recall it was in St. Louis. Okay. And I was kind of browsing the, the symposium program, just kind of flipping through the little booklet, right, yeah. that you get when you register. And there's a little blurb about kind of this newfangled program called Doctor of Plant Medicine. I'm like, what the heck is this? And I read the description, and literally it, it paralleled perfectly kind of an MD or a DO program or even a, a DVM program wow. just on the plant side. And I said, wow, so basically this is kind of an applied practitioner degree program for plants, and you get to be a generalist. And that really resonated with me. So I went to a little informational session that they had. They had some current students presenting okay. on the topic. And, and I was sold, basically. Wow. So I said, you know, the moment I get back from New Zealand, I'm going to enroll in this program. And it was at the University of Florida. Okay. Go How Gators. Long, is that a four-year program? It's a four-year program, okay. typically. But the year, roughly the year-long coursework that I did in New Zealand transferred in. So I didn't have to stay quite the full four years. Wow, I think okay. it was like three and three quarters. So what kind of stuff do you do <clears throat> during those four years? So during those four years, basically, th they've since revamped the program a okay. little bit since when I was in it. But at the time, and, and still largely now, 
it, it's basically kind of subdivided among topical areas. Hmm. So like an MD program, you know, presumably you would talk about uh, parasitology, histology, uh, pathology, all yeah. the ologies, yeah. right? <laughs> so we more or less did the same thing. But we broke it down into entomology slash nematology okay. slash acarology. So that's mites. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. And we also did plant pathology. And we also had kind of plant science slash soil science. So that's, those are kind of the three thematic areas that we focused on. And we had to complete, it was 120 credits total. Wow. So that's almost like doing your undergrad all over yeah, again it really is. at the graduate level. And, you know, think about this. Graduate level is about threefold the coursework. Yeah. Gosh. So a lot of coursework. There's no dissertation, you know, like a traditional Ph.D. Sure. program. I mean, you guys in the medical field obviously don't have to do a dissertation, although it right. helps to do research yeah. on the side, which a lot of us do. Um, but we also have quite a bit of, I guess you could say, clinicals and internships. Uh, okay. yeah. So I worked at a, a plant disease clinic kind of like plant triage <laughs> of sorts. I worked at a nematode assay lab. What's that um, entail? So basically that's trying to, you take soil samples from farmers throughout the state, in this case, Florida, and basically kind of try to quantify how many, so you kind of extract the nematodes from that soil sample. So they give you like, it's a hundred and I think hundred cubic centimeter okay. sample roughly. And you try to quantify how many and what types of nematodes hmm. and if they are at actionable levels. So are there enough of nematode X, Y, and Z to justify doing something? Okay. That's kind of the, the gist of it. So I did, I did some of that. You basically, <laughs> you have these little Petri dishes and they're, they're filled with just different types of, of nematodes. And you have to be able to spot ID them and count them. Hmm. to do that quantification. <laughs> so that, that's kind of tedious. Yeah, it sounds like But it. I understand, you know, the relevance mm -hmm. of it. So we did some of that. I worked at a kind of a soil diagnostic facility. Mm. Uh, we used what's called ICP, inductively coupled plasma, to mm. quantify the amount of nutrients already present in a soil and then kind of formulate a recommendation for fertilizer based on that. Wow, okay. So, I mean, if you have enough nitrogen, for example, it doesn't make any sense to suggest that they add 150 pounds of N to yeah, the acre. Right. It's just, it's overkill because it's going to cause environmental issues, externalities, sure. as we like to say. Yeah. So we kind of cycle through all those and it's really cool. I'm pretty curious about the nematodes. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit more about what exactly nematodes are and what? Yeah. I, I, they're kind of underappreciated, I think. So an, a nematode is basically... It's an unsegmented roundworm. So it is not an earthworm at all. I want to stress that <laughs> yeah. to your listening audience. Yeah. I mean, are they're, they're kind of serpentine in structure. And they're often unappreciated, but they can cause significant injury and economic damage mm. to select crops. And these specifically happen to be plant parasitic nematodes. Mm -hmm. They have these really interesting mouth parts that all, and when they feed it's almost like they're kind of jackhammering wow the outer surface of the plant and they're kind of sucking up the juices hmm, interesting but they're they're kind of quirky <laughs> <laughs> but again it's it's also was extremely tedious yeah. to count them but but you learn about their their physiology their biology you learn about their we like to say management instead of control hmm. so that that's one of those kind of almost anal retentive things that we have in the ag field. Whenever you say controlling something, that kind of implies that you have zero tolerance yeah, for okay. any stragglers, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just not feasible. So we say <laughs> management, bringing it down beneath an established threshold. Okay. So if we could take, say, just for, I'm just making these numbers up. Mm -hmm. So let's say the threshold is 20 root nut nematodes for every 100 cubic centimeters of soil that's submitted. That's kind of the empirically or scientifically determined threshold, right? Okay. So if you're below that, what recommendation are you going to make to a farmer? You're going to say, well, at this time, you don't need to necessarily do anything. It doesn't make sense 
to apply a nematicide mm -hmm. in this case. It doesn't justify it, right? You're, you're basically just kind of pissing away yeah. <laughs> your money, okay? But if you're above that threshold, then that means you need to do something stat. Otherwise, you're going to realize significant losses. Okay. So it is time yeah. to implement some sort of action, be it a nematicide, be it a biological control agent, something. So are these nematicides, are they potentially harmful to humans or anything like that? After I mean, as with any pesticide, and again, pesticide is kind of an umbrella yeah. term, right? That includes nematicides, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, okay. bactericides, avicides. It just goes on and on. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, they can certainly be harmful if you don't follow the, the label. Okay. So are you familiar with kind of pesticide labels Not at so all? Not It's almost like a little booklet, basically, okay. that directs you how to not only kind of mix, but also the personal protective equipment that you need. Do you need like, you know, extra long gloves? Do you need a respirator? Mm. Do you need a full Tyvek bodysuit? Which is that's almost unheard of nowadays. Okay. You know, so the materials out on the market are extremely safe. Mm -hmm. They won't pass EPA muster unless they are. So a lot of people are, you talked about controversies uh -huh. before, right? So a lot of individuals are concerned about, you know, pesticide residues mm -hmm. and- Yeah, and washing off. Like, washing uh, off the residues yeah. and, and even like drift. So if you're in a development that kind of abuts a farmer's field, maybe okay. some drift is getting into your yard and you're getting a little panicky that your kids are out there kind of playing and frolicking sure. and they're getting these, these doses. But I think what most people need to understand is that the amounts of, of pesticides that we use today are trivial. Mm. So you have to think about what's called the use rate. So basically, a lot of materials nowadays, like eight fluid ounces per acre. Wow. So okay. think about that. You're yeah. taking eight ounces of this material from a jug, right? Pouring it in your tank and then basically kind of filling it to, say, 30, 40 gallons mm. with just straight up water. So that's highly dilute to begin with and spraying it out on an acre of real estate. Yeah. So how much actual material is out and about in the environment? Very little. And most of that pesticidal material, usually only like half of it is actually the active ingredient, the toxicant, ah, okay. what's actually doing the dirty work, so to speak, right? A lot of it is just like fillers and stabilizers and other things. And for the most part, those toxicants would be selected toward whatever you're trying Generally, to Generally, they are. Right. Exactly. So they have a high degree of specificity okay. towards that specific pest. We want to try to avoid collateral damage yeah. at all if we can, right? That's the idea. And so the greatest risk when we talk about pesticides and human health, that's largely to the applicator, you know, him or herself. Okay. Because they're working with the actual concentrate yeah. in the jug, right, off the shelf. And God forbid something spills. Or I don't know how the heck they would drink it inadvertently, yeah. but you never know. Or breathing it in. Or, or, or breathing it yeah. in. So, you know, dermal or kind of oral or just mm -hmm. inhalation means of administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> it, it's really not a concern to the public at large. Yeah. There, but so there's... when people talk about things like the Clean 15 or... Dirty, dirty dozen. dozen. Clean yeah, 15, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Like, so... so that's Environmental Working Group. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they do that every year, okay. and it's and it, it just scares the bejesus out of parents. So especially. you're saying people probably shouldn't be so worried about that. They should not be worried dozen. because um, think about all the plant materials. So any plant that has kind of a culinary kick to it, right? So like you know hot peppers, uh -huh. for instance. That that's capsaicin. That basically is a built-in feeding deterrent. That's a pesticide. Yeah. People don't understand this, but they think that the body somehow discriminates between, oh, it was man-made or it's au natural. Hmm. The body doesn't care, right? right? If it's toxic, it's toxic. And, you know, medical practitioners, I think, should be aware of that sure. as well, yeah. but, but largely they, they aren't. Yeah, so I mean, I didn't even know. Um, yeah. <laughs> they advise people to eat organically, for example, because they think organic means no pesticide use, and that's total bunk. Hmm. Because they do use pesticides. Yeah. It just has to be natural, mm, naturally okay. derived. But that doesn't imply safety at all. No, yeah, exactly. The okay. most toxic thing that we're aware of to date is Botox. And that's totally <laughs> natural, right? Yeah. Clostridium botulinum. 
That is very natural. Everyone gets the injections. Everybody gets, of course, that's highly dilute, right? Mm, so that mm. also exemplifies another point that the dose makes the poison. Sure. And people don't understand that. Yeah. So, but yeah, this, I, I was actually going to bring up that dirty dozen yeah. scenario. Interesting that you brought it up. <laughs> the amounts of residues are so trivial. Okay. And the, the body is well adapted to deal with those trivial residues. Yeah. Mm. There's a site um, online. I think it's safefruitsandveggies.com or some variant thereof. And it has a calculator that you can use to basically guesstimate how much of a given food commodity you would have to eat to get a like a one-time acute toxic dose. <laughs> So people, I think one of the, the biggest offenders on this Dirty Dozen is like strawberries, for example. Yeah. So, okay, let's look at the actual science behind it. You would have to eat something like probably 400 servings of strawberries. And I think a serving is like a quarter pound or something to that effect. Oh, wow. So like, and again, I'm, look at the actual website yeah. for the hard numbers. I'm just giving you, your listenership some scenarios here. Sure. But you'd have to eat like 100 pounds of strawberries in a single sitting to get enough residues <laughs> to be toxic. Yeah. I think my stomach would long since burst oh, yeah, before, sure. <laughs> you know, after maybe a couple pounds or a few pounds. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. People don't, don't just get this. And, and this environmental working group and other environmentalist groups, they really harp on this. So where's this all coming from? Like, where do they get these ideas that it's, you know... Is it rooted in history somewhere that I mean, certain pesticides were harming people and now that just everywhere, everyone now is concerned about it? Or is it just kind of coming out of nowhere? I mean, the pesticides that we've used in the past, granted, were much more harmful than the ones we've used today. Okay. So we used to use things like heavy metal based. So like mercuric chloride. Or lead arsenate. <laughs> that doesn't sound I too mean, good. think about those two, <laughs> yeah. right? That doesn't sound so appetizing necessarily. Yeah. But they, they worked well, but they were kind of just broad spectrum biocides, right? They just killed everything kind of indiscriminately. Okay. And as we discussed before, that's not what you want. Right. You want specificity. You want to go after specific targets. Mm. Leave the good bugs, right? And that seems to be another point where GMOs can come in so that they can you can kind of hone in on that specificity. Exactly. And that's one of the benefits of a specific type of GMO, so it's, it's called BT. Okay. I don't know if you've heard of this no, before. No, so BT it. basically stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. So okay. you're familiar with the genus oh. Bacillus, mm -hmm. right? Yep. It's just a, it's soil bacterium, basically. Mm -hmm. And scientists, it was like 90 years ago, found that this bacterium made its own, it's a crystal protein. It's basically a, a protein-based toxin that was really effective against caterpillars, um, some flies and also some beetles. Okay. But mostly it's usually targeted against caterpillars. So what we did in the kind of intervening time is that we learned how to kind of mass rear and grow out these, these bacteria who would make these spores, these resilient kind of resting structures mm -hmm. that had these protonaceous toxins in them. And you could basically formulate a pesticide based off these endo spores yeah wow so you, you basically you just get a, a little it's a little pack about probably yay big it's it's pulverized it's powder but it's the actual spores themselves you dump it into your tank fill it up to volume with water spray it out just like a conventional pesticide wow okay and it works very well and there when are a couple, did they roll that out and it was like 90 years 90 ago, years ago. Wow. and uh, organic growers use it religiously <laughs> yeah um, and it works very well. It's highly specific. It's not toxic to humans at all. It's LD50 is greater than 5,000 milligrams per kilogram. Wow. Okay. So, so you'd LD have to eat meaning lethal dose. Lethal dose for 50% of mm -hmm. a population. Exactly. So anything 5,000 or above basically means for all intents and purposes, it's non-toxic. Right. You have to consume an inordinate amount to maybe get a stomach ache. Okay. I'm not talking like even outright dying yeah <laughs> so that's that's the thing again that people don't necessarily yeah. realize so it really sounds like there's a lot of misconceptions out there right now there are a lot of misconceptions and with the gmo angle what we did was we said okay well we've kind of characterized and isolated the genes in that bacterium responsible for the production of that that crystal kind of protonaceous 
toxin. Mm -hmm. Let's cut and paste it into corn, for example. Give the corn the ability to make its own built-in, what's called a PIP, a plant-incorporated protectant. Mm. So, and a lot of plants, like I mentioned before, that have that culinary kick, make their own built-in pesticides, right? So we're just kind of endowing corn with the ability to make a new built-in pesticide. And it's, it's protein-based, totally biodegradable, and administration is tied to herbivory. So what does that mean? Well, that means the, the insect has to physically feed on the crop to get a dose of it. Oh, okay. Right? Yep. So if you're, a, if you're a beneficial and you're not nibbling on that corn tissue, you're not going to get a dose of it. You're totally insulated. Yeah. And, you know, the, the conditions in an insect gut are very different from our guts. And one of the perks of, of this, this BT protein, GMO, you know, style, <laughs> is basically you have to have an alkaline gut, okay. which we don't. Right. We obviously yeah. have a very acidic yeah. <laughs> gut. Anyone who has acid reflux like I do can, can attest to that. Um, you also have to have very specific receptors in your gut. And insects do, we don't. Receptors for those? Um, for those toxins. Yep. So they actually bind to those, those receptors, and it, it physically kind of lyses or kind of breaks apart the lining of the stomach wow, wall okay. in the insect. And it, it's almost kind of like they die of a septicemia. Hmm. It's kind of a nasty way yeah. to go, but it doesn't impact us. We're yeah, we're safe worth a that. darn. <laughs> and it's, it's the same exact material that you get in that formulated commercial product that you spray out in organic fields. It's hmm. the same stuff. It's just the mode of administration is a little bit different. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So it, it's cool stuff. That is cool stuff. That's the future of ag. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We're, tr we're trying to be eco-friendly. We're trying to maximize agricultural production on the smallest footprint of land that we can mm. while still feeding the 7.5 billion and growing. Yeah, wow. You know, it's poised to grow another, what, 3 billion probably, according to UN demographers, yeah. in just the next 30 years. So here's another rabbit hole we can go down. I heard great. just... You know, eavesdropping, overheard a conversation the other day in formation. <laughs> um, you were talking to somebody about um, the Earth's carrying capacity. Yes, yes. And where you think things are going from there. Right, right. So where do you think we top out at as far as human population? I mean, there are a couple of different, <laughs> and I kind of use these examples in my class, okay. of different absolute caps. Now, there's a couple of schools of thought that say our cap is 1.5 billion. So if that's the case, then we're grossly in overshoot mode yeah. right now, right? Because we're at seven and a half, roughly. Other people say, no, no, we can sustainably feed maybe 50 billion people. But that that's Jeez. kind of an outlandish scenario because it basically necessitates that we start living underground, more or less as mole people. Ah, okay. Rather interestingly. <laughs> That's interesting, yeah. The reason or being, or, or somewhere, <laughs> right? Like Atlantis-type yeah. domes or something to that effect. So let me just pause real quick. Yeah. What, what is this class that you're teaching? That you talk about this kind of Well, th this, it's a number of classes, but okay. predominantly my agricultural issues okay. course. It's just a freshman first semester kind of introductory course that looks at some of these controversies that we've been talking about more in depth. Okay. And we do a lot of kind of role-playing, scenario-based yeah. we'll instruction. <laughs> and we can come back to that, yeah, certainly. Definitely. But, uh, you know, talking about these, the carrying capacity, mm -hmm. if we wanted to feed 50, God forbid, 50 billion people which would be horrific, I yeah. think. We'd all be living underground because every square inch of real estate on the Earth's surface would basically have to be turned into farmland. Mm. There would be no wildlands anymore whatsoever. Wow. So that's... and <laughs> that you know, doesn't sound too pleasant. Doesn't sound too pleasant. And is that really sustainable? Can you do something in perpetuity, right? Yeah. No. So I don't think that kind of meets a sustainability litmus test. So what about things like colonizing the moon or Mars or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that, and that kind of came up as well during yeah. that, that offhanded discussion that you heard, at least <laughs> yeah. in part. So, yeah, colonizing Luna or colonizing Mars. Just think about the sheer energetic requirements necessary to do that. Yeah. You know, a lot of people have said, well, we have so much garbage here terrestrially. Let's just launch it into space. <laughs> well, think about the energy requirements yeah, to do that. And think about the carbon 
emissions, right? The right. carbon footprint of an action like of that. Launching, it's just gonna yeah. it's just gonna <laughs> exacerbate our climate change issue. Right. So you think you're alleviating one problem, but you're exacerbating another one. Sure. Yeah. So it doesn't make much sense to me. I, I don't see that <clears throat> that kind of terraforming of the moon being a viable because you'd have to somehow option. transport back and forth. Or we'd have to just complete new civilization. There, or, and, and we'd have to be able to extract what we need from the, the moon's crust. Right. And oh, that's yeah. very energetically intensive, right? Yeah. You got to think the full kind of cradle to grave mm. analysis of this. And it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. So 50 billion high point, one and a half billion. Probably one and a half. Low. I mean, that's, that's what I've been reading. Okay. And we're poised to probably be at 10 and a half. I mean, there's some kind of flex in that number by 2050. Wow. That's but a lot. That, that's a lot. So think of all those extra mouths that we have to feed. Yeah. And especially the fact that they want to eat like we do. Most of that growth is going to be in the developing world, mm -hmm. right? And they kind of aspire to live like Americans do, like Europeans do, like Australians and New Zealanders do. Yeah. So that, you know, that means they want to eat a lot of meat as uh, well. They yeah. don't want a strictly plant-based diet. And a lot of the, the corn that we grow here in the States, about 50% of it is immediately siphoned off to fatten livestock, mm. right? So we're converting plant-based protein into animal-based protein, which is much more complete and to a lot of people more palatable. Mm. So that's, that that's something else yeah. you got to think of, right? I've seen some things with these laboratories that are trying to grow meat. Basically. The Impossible Burger yeah. and things yep. like that. So how feasible do you think that is? I think it's very feasible. They just have to get the, the economics kind of yeah. aligned like with, the, large with the demand. Okay. Right. But again, you're, you're kind of growing cells that have more or less been collected from animals hmm. in, in these big kind of oversized vats with like a nutrient broth. Yeah. But it, the problem, at least to date, and I think they've, they've overcome this to some extent, is getting the texture right and getting mm -hmm. kind of the, the marbly quality of at least beef correct. It's very hard to approximate. Yeah. Okay. Huh. So that's kind of the, the next hump that we have to get over yeah. on the, the synthetic meat horizon. Hmm. Yeah. So where do you think, so you're thinking we'll hit 10 billion in the next, you know, 30 next years. Next 30 years. This is. Is that sustainable, do you think? I think it is in the short term because post 2050, we're actually slated to decline okay. Why in is population. That? A number of things. So most of it is due to the fact that deaths are going to grossly exceed births at that point because people just won't be having as many children. Hmm. We're going to be below replacement level. So... That means that ultimately our numbers are going to kind of plummet over time. Women just don't want to have six, eight kids anymore. Right. They yeah. want to actually have careers. And I can't blame them right. at all in the slightest. You know, and those that are having children are waiting much longer. Right. You know, they're not having children at 20, 25. They might be having children at 35, 40, hmm. potentially. So you're kind of lengthening that that generational window so that is going to in time lead to a decrease in population women are just more educated birth control etc but at the same time uh we also have huge advances in medicine that are keeping people living longer living longer too so uh, does that factor into those those models i think it factors into that model into that okay. conversation yeah as well now granted we've had a lot of advancements but it, i keep on hearing in the news that, you know, this generation is going to be the first generation to, in a couple generations, to not outlive their parents oh, really? just because of diet, et cetera. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. It's yeah. hard to factor in all these things into, you know, yeah. this, this big cauldron and kind of mix it around and, and then after make all, these it predictions. Is just a prediction the it end, is. Yeah. It is. Hmm. But, I mean, there's, there's kind of a low-end prediction and a high-end prediction from the U.N. demographers, mm. and it's between, like, 9.5 and probably 11 billion. Okay. So I kind of just take the rough midpoint, 10, ten and a quarter, 10 and a half, okay. give or take. Interesting. But I think come, you know, at post-2050, we'll be in pretty good shape. We'll actually probably have too much infrastructure. 
We'll have to kind of scale things down a little bit. It'd almost be like a an end game, you know, Thanos kind of post snap yeah. scenario. Interesting. And we'll yeah. just kind of contract instead of expand. And then I think maybe we could actually live in harmony with yeah, with go. Gaia, <laughs> with Mother Earth yeah. for a change. When we reach kind of a new equilibrium, hmm. a new carrying capacity. Wow. Which I think is probably about that one point five billion in time. Hmm. You now, think it'll go the whole way back down? I, I think we'll reach a new steady state. Okay. Ultimately. And you know, in in time we may become endangered species ourselves <laughs> if people aren't opting to have kids. Yeah. And that's a whole nother discussion, of course. <laughs> but you know, none of this is gonna materialize until probably oh Lord, thirty fifty. Wow. Okay. It's, it's so a ways. ways it's a ways off. Yeah. Well beyond our generational sure. concerns. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So let's go back to the classes. Yeah. Um, so you're a professor at at what? Ferrum, College Ferrum College in Virginia. Okay. So it's in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains, about 45, 50 minutes south of Roanoke. Okay. And how long have you been teaching? I've been there for six years. Okay. And then you decided somewhere in there, let's join the army. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, this was in oh God, 2016, I think it was. We had a couple of recruiters come to our, we have a Friday seminar series for mm-hmm. all of those kind of in the sciences. And they were kind of on the agenda. And I just happened to attend. And I got talking with one of the recruiters and he knew at least three or four uh, students that were in my former degree program at Mm. University of Florida that had joined as entomologists based on our broad-based training. That's a small world. Because we had, it really was, but we had that, that foundation, even though it was agricultural entomology, you know, we were seen as, as good candidates to become more military entomologists, which of course is more on the veterinary medical side of things. Yeah. So what, what does that entail being a, a military, military entomologist? entomologist? I wish I could tell you from experience. I haven't got to that point yet. Sure. Um, I have to complete DCC with you, mm-hmm. obviously, yeah. and also BOLIC, which is Basic Officers Leadership Training Course, which will be about in a year's time, okay. give or take. But after that, you're kind of off of, quote unquote, probation and become a full-fledged officer. And then you could do more things that are related to your AOC, your area of concentration, mm-hmm. which is just kind of for your listenership kind of an alphanumeric designator for what your job is yeah. in the Army, right? So we're 72 Bravos as entomologists. So did whenever you were recruited and, and up to this point, has, has anyone really explained any of the duties you'd be doing? Or is it just kind of a... I mean, I, I have some conception of what okay. it entails. And the Army does have a very good site kind of outlining what, what you would be doing. A lot of it is just kind of monitoring in, say, barracks and, and other encampments okay. for... Not only kind of nuisance pests, so think things like cockroaches, Mm -hmm. for example, but also mosquitoes, um, any other kind of biting insect that could potentially vector disease. Okay. One of the things that we like to hype in the the Army kind of entomology community is that kind of pest management is really the ultimate force multiplier you get the most bang for the buck. Because soldiers nowadays are not necessarily falling prey to traditional gunshot wounds. Now, IEDs, of course, are still a concern. And and we feel for them, certainly. But the biggest and I think most imminent threat to most soldiers is going to be those diseases that are going to be vectored by insects. And just that general level of of discomfort, which could lead to, you know, peripheral sicknesses. Mm as well. So, you know, simple monitoring and pesticide application program, you know, do it, do it smartly. Okay. Be judicious yeah. about it. Don't go ballistic. Overkill, Don't overkill. Yeah. <laughs> but that's going to lead to the health of your, of your soldiers. Okay. At multiple levels. Yeah. And just make us more combat ready should the need arise. So are you looking forward to this? This new I'm, adventure? I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I mean, this this has really been <laughs> kind of a, a whirlwind yeah. in a lot of ways. I was just looking, you know, I'm 40. I'm not I'm not a young man anymore. I'm certainly no spring chicken. <laughs> but I can keep up with you youngins pretty oh, well, I think. Yeah, you, you destroyed that ACFT. <laughs> I did. Yeah. I did. I did pretty darn well. 
but uh, j- just a way to kind of repurpose what I've already learned in entomology and, and maybe in time even teach a course in medical and veterinary entomology at Ferrum College. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe I'll go on sabbatical a year and teach some classes at Walter Reed, yeah. perhaps. Wow. All cool. these <laughs> options are possibly on the table. So, Is there a possibility of deployment for you? There is. Okay. There is. Absolutely. So incidentally, my, my unit is being deployed to Afghanistan okay. later this year. I don't want to give away too many specifics, yeah. obviously, <laughs> or in terms of, you know, locations in yeah. Afghanistan, but they are being deployed. I unfortunately can't join them because I haven't completed Bullock yet. Right. And I feel awful yeah. about that. But they're going to be doing a lot of this, this surveillance and kind of maintenance, et cetera, okay. for insects. They'll kind of be hopscotching around the different campsites, et cetera, and wow. barracks taking care of that. That's pretty neat. Actually. So that's, yeah. you know, that's right on the money for what I want to do. Yeah. I want to make a contribution. I'm certainly not infantry. Quality. Yeah, I don't think any of us. Are. I don't think any of us are most likely, but we can all play our part in the the ongoing conflict. Yeah, yeah. Be constructive about it. Le- leverage our talents for a greater good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow. So there's a lot. I have this whole list that you know I gave you this list <laughs> yes. of things I might ask. Um, I think we've asked a lot of questions, um, but there are some things I kind of wanted to get at. Yeah. Before um, before we wrap things up. So, what is, what what is your take? So you're you're a doctor of plant medicine, Correct. meaning like you take care of the plants, right? So I take care of the plants. So I'm interested in kind of holistic plant health. So what do you think of the other way around? Um, plants taking care of us, like medicines that we use from plants. That okay. So you're talking like botanical extracts yeah. from plants, etc. And that's that's kind of a misconception among a lot of the public when they hear, oh, doctor of plant medicine, so you're using plant botanicals to cure human <laughs> yeah. ailments. And then I have to explain, well, no, I'm literally a plant doctor, just yeah. like a DVM or an MDDO, right? I, I don't have a lot of experience in that field necessarily, okay. but I, I think there is kind of that, that soothing aspect of yeah. plants. You know, a lot of public gardens, horticultural setups... Plants can enrich our lives in more ways than one. It's not just the food angle, although granted that's what I'm yeah. largely focused on. I'm not necessarily interested in like landscape plants, etc. So, what about like coevolution of plants along with humans? Have you looked into I've, that? I've delved into from... that a little bit, okay. and and a lot of that coevolution, a lot of it is is human kind of mediated, yeah. as you can okay. expect. But, you know, think about the first, you know, wheat plant, for example, growing in kind of the, the Levant, kind of the Middle East, right? Mm-hmm. The, the Fertile Crescent. And now it's all like over the say. place. And that was all over the place, right? But, you know, we, over many generations, would just kind of select the best prospects from each crop. Mm-hmm. And in the case of wheat, we were looking for things that, basically individual plants that didn't shatter, and you're saying, okay, well, shatter, what the heck yeah. does that mean? So have you ever seen kind of the, the seed head of a wheat plant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the individual kernels, right, the seeds, stay on that head, right? You can vigorously shake it, and they really don't fall off. Well, historically, they did ah, fall okay. off like that <laughs> in a heartbeat. And if you're a wild, undomesticated species, that's advantageous, right? You want to disseminate your seeds as quickly and as far as yeah. possible. So it behooves that plant to do that, right? But if we want to actually harvest the wheat, and the moment we try to harvest it, everything just falls to the ground, that's not very efficient. So we selected deliberately for wheat plants and other things that would not shatter, that would not just immediately drop their seeds upon being touched. It's kind of ironic then that that new model where they don't drop, just drop their seeds and now there's so many more wheat plants than there. And now, right. And then we use that as kind of breeding stock once we, once we had the knowledge. You know, for yeah. many generations we didn't understand, um, you know, Mendelian genetics, mm-hmm. et cetera. But now, now we do. Yeah. So it, it was largely kind of a crapshoot plant breeding back <laughs> back in the day. Yeah. You just select the best and brightest and use those as breeding stock for the next generation, right? Collect the seeds from that generation, select the best and the brightest. 
But now we can make very targeted changes, be it through conventional breeding or through genetic modification yeah. as well. Okay. Have you dabbled much in the area of, like, fungi? Um, I, have. Okay. I have. Plant fungi. Okay. Specifically, and plant bacteria, plant microbes. Okay, so yeah. like their interaction and mm -hmm. okay. That's kind of the plant pathology angle, just in in a nutshell. Okay, that was one of the major kind of three parts of the triad yeah. you could say of my instruction. Okay, in grad Cause, school, because it seems recently there's been a lot more um, hype around fungi as far as you know for human use, like supplements and things mm -hmm. like that. like lion's mane, yeah. etc. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so. Um, I was just kind of curious as far as like maintenance of those, you know, like taking care of plants as a plant, a doctor of plant medicine. Are, are there similar things that afflict these fungi or it's complete bit of I mean, there, there are to some extent. Mo you'll find, at least in academia, most people who have a background in, in botany, in plants, also have a background in fungi. Okay, yeah, that's kind of what I was There are many intersections. About. Yeah. Yeah, so they're almost like a package deal. Okay. And how did those work? Like, like, let's take lion's mane, for example. Would there just be a farm of lion's mane, or I don't know work? much about the cultivation of lion's mane. Okay. I'm thinking more like, you know, shiitake mushrooms oh, yeah. or something, that, yeah. which we do on, on the campus farm okay. at, at Ferrum. Um, and you know, that's basically very straightforward. Just take a, a number of logs, bore some holes in them, <laughs> fill them with the inoculum, kind of wet them down, and just come back X number of months later, and you're raring to go. Yeah, interesting. But I'm not, I'm not aware of, you know, kind of parasites of a parasite. So in the case of, like, the shiitakes, mm -hmm. they're kind of acting as a, a parasite of the wood. But is there a parasite, a hyperparasite in essence, mm. a parasite of the fungi itself yeah that gets kind of convoluted <laughs> ecologically yeah. speaking so i don't know if this is up your alley at all but like as far as um trees go mm -hmm. um, i know at least in my area back home there's all sorts of different pests that are coming and wiping out whole species of trees <laughs> like the emerald ash borer that's um, the big one in virginia right now okay and yeah. there's also um, gypsy moth, woody adelgid, woody with, adelgid yeah. with hemlock. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is there any yeah. way to actually like stop that progression like further north or further south or wherever they're going? Or is it just kind of inevitable that these... Once something is introduced, you almost have to throw up your hands and consider it established and mm -hmm. kind of endemic. Okay. And that's, that's unfortunate. Yeah. I mean, there are steps, there are monitoring steps that we can take to kind of nip the, the spread in the bud, but it's exceedingly mm. difficult to, to contain these, these new invasives. Is and there any way to protect individual trees? Like say you have this family <laughs> ash tree that's been, you know, it's always been on the property. It's this huge tree. Is there any way to save that or is it just done? Mm, it's probably done. It's, <laughs> it's exceedingly difficult. Yeah. Okay. So I, I can give you an example. And this is more of a disease based Example, so uh, citrus canker is a disease that really kind of came to a full froth in like 2005 in Florida. Okay. And basically the state mandated that any citrus trees, healthy citrus trees, that were found within like a 1,900-foot radius of an infected citrus tree had to just be summarily destroyed. Wow. And a lot of people had these, you know, it's like grandma's old mm. heirloom tree that they wanted to maintain, and they would just outright refuse mm. to destroy them. And the state, I think the state did have some money to kind of compensate landowners for their loss, but then that ran out. And eventually mm. they just threw their hands up in disgust and said, hell with it, it's endemic, there's nothing else we can do. Wow. So that kind of now rests on the hands of breeders mm. to basically, because that's always your first line of defense against invasive pests, invasive diseases, breed for resistance. Okay. Basically make that particular species, variety, cultivar, just an inhospitable host. Okay. I've also heard of introducing another you know, insect or pest to kill the... Yeah, you can do that. That can get hairy in and of itself. <laughs> okay. So, again, we talked about specificity mm -hmm. before, right? So the idea is that 
So let's say an invasive species was from Asia, for example, okay? And it somehow tagged along, found its way here to the States, and is just wreaking havoc in forests, just hypothetically speaking. So the idea behind, and this is kind of classical biological control, it's a specific flavor of biocontrol, is that you kind of go back to the original range of that pest. So you kind of dispatch scientists to go back to Asia, its old stomping grounds, yeah. right? And you kind of survey and find some antagonistic critters that would either eat it or lay eggs within it or like fungi that were possibly parasitic on it. And then bring it back to the States and just kind of release in mass and hope it knocks them down to reasonable levels. Yeah. Ideally to, yeah. to nothing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But of course, the issue with that is you never know how really specific they are, these new imported biological agents, until you run an exhaustive battery of tests. And that can take years, millions of dollars. Do we have the resources to do that? Hmm. And generally, we only do for the really expensive commodities. Okay. So if it's like an up-and-coming niche crop, no one's probably going to yeah. care. That's gotcha. the issue. Yeah. Hmm. But on paper, that's a sound strategy. So is that, you know, all that analysis and the work towards that, is that an entomologist role or is that more something in forestry or, you know? That's an entomological role. Okay. That's that's probably a, a USDA APHIS. You all familiar with with APHIS no, at all? No. Animal Plant Health Inspection okay. Service. So they're kind of a subset of of USDA. Okay. And my understanding is that they would do those okay. types of of tests in collaboration with the land grant institutions like the Virginia Techs, the NC States, mm -hmm. the Penn States, etc. Yeah. Gotcha. Right. All right, so I got one more question. This okay. comes from my co-host. Uh, normally, normally I host this podcast <laughs> with uh, my friend Cole, right. and I texted him about, you know, I was going to interview you, okay. and I said if he had any questions. And the one thing he was curious about is, what do you think of insects as a food source? So there's these things called um, exoprotein, like cricket protein bars, and mm -hmm. also whenever I was down in Panama, there were some people that would just eat termites off the trees or whatever. Which, which and, I've done. Yeah, and yeah. They, what is it? They said it tastes like, some said spicy, some said like a pineapple. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's that's called entomophagy, okay. is the, the proper term. I, incidentally, I just wrote a piece on that. I have a monthly column with Ag Daily. Ah. So if any of your listenership yeah, is interested, definitely. just look up Tim Durham, Plant MD, Ag Daily. All right. Yeah. Com. And I, it, was, it was either two or three months ago I wrote on this specifically. So if you look at the amount of, of energy that you have to invest to basically fatten up an insect compared to, say, a chicken, a pig, a beef cow, etc., mm. it's significantly less energetically intensive. Okay. And they could still provide you know, the full assortment of amino acids. It's, mm. it's complete yeah. nutrition. Interesting. So it's, it's almost, it's puzzling to me why we don't do it already. Yeah. And I think it's just the, the ick factor. Probably. It's yeah. cultural, yeah. right? So if you go to South America or select regions of Asia, even, you know, the African continent, yeah. entomophagy is the norm. Huh. They don't mind. So what do termites taste like to you? You know, mm. anything or do they just taste I, like I couldn't really peg them to anything okay. specifically. I, I, but it's not like an ick thing. Like, no. You don't have to spit it up right no, away. No, not yeah. at all. I mean, I've, yeah, termites I've eaten. I've eaten grubs, um, hmm. crickets. Wow. It, it, I think it's just how you. It is definitely a cultural thing. It is right? a cultural yeah. thing. How you prepare them. Okay. So, you know, as is whole on like, you know, skewers like shish kebab. Mm. I don't think that would necessarily <laughs> fly for most people. Probably not. But if you were to kind of grow them in these big insectaries, these big mass rearing facilities and kind of, you know, kill them and just dry them down and kind of pulverize them into like a protein powder yeah. and then incorporate that into breads or something yeah. else. Or like these bars. That, or these yeah. bars. That would be a more efficient way. Did you see uh, Blade Runner? Was it 2049? I haven't seen You that. haven't seen that one? Mm -hmm. The beginning of the movie actually starts with 
that oh, kind right. of scenario where oh, there's cool. it's it's Dave Batista the wrestler. Yeah. Basically, he's he's growing. They look like little grubs. I didn't really get a good shot of them, but they look like little beetle grubs, basically, in kind of the the outskirts of Los Angeles, this desolate wasteland that he had converted into a a protein farm, in essence. So it seems that that was the tact that they decided to take Hmm. to satisfy their protein needs. Yeah. So well, maybe that's kind of prophetic. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like something definitely we should look into. I think more. we should investigate it. And it kind of goes along the lines with like, well, similarly, I guess, with bees, how they make honey, um, and we right. can ingest that. Right. Um, I just want to touch on that real quick, too. I know I said that. But like, what do you think of the Save the Bees movement that's going on? Is there a big problem with bees right now? Are they really dwindling? And well, I, and yeah. What can we do about it? So we've heard kind of these these dire predictions. It's the the last dance of the honeybee, right? Mm-hmm. And without honeybees, which we're dependent on for a lot of pollination. Absolutely. This again really came to a head hmm, probably five years ago or so. Okay. I would say, and it's it's basically colony collapse disorder. CCD is kind of this kind of run of the mill term that not only apiculturalists, so bee scientists, but also kind of the public at large has kind of pounced on. So what is CCD? So CCD is, from what I've read, really kind of a, it has a multifactorial causation. So a lot of things are responsible for this. Hmm. But the gist of it is that bees kind of leave their hives and they just abscond. They don't come back. So just these numbers would precipitously decline. And the question is, well, what, is there something environmental? Uh, Is there a parasite? Is it something humans are influencing that's mm. just leading to these mass kind of defections of sort? And I'm not an apiculturist by by any stretch. You should talk to my my buddy, Kurt Langberg, who's also here, one of the other entomologists. But he deals with honeybee kind of physiology. Mm. So he'd be a great person to ask about that. But the bottom line is it was suggested by the environmentalist community that a specific class of insecticides was the sole cause of this. Mm. And they're called neonicotinoids or neonics for short. Basically, it's a synthetic nicotine analog. (laughs) It's human-made nicotine with some chemical changes, Mm. of course. But it had great activity against uh, pest insects. And the thought was that, well, the honeybees are kind of collateral damage in this. If you look at the data, though, it's really hard to justify that being the cause. Mm. It's, it's really multifactorial. There's a, a virus that has been implicated in CCD, at least in part, And again, it's kind of hard to tease out the relative contributions of everything in aggregate. Israeli acute paralysis virus was implicated. There's a varroa mite that basically kind of takes over hives and feeds on the young. There's a tracheal mite, which literally gets in their trachea. You can see it walking around. It's rather interesting. So a couple parasite prospects. Um, People have really gone out in left field saying, oh my God, it's it's electromagnetic radiation from cell phones. That's totally nonsense. Mm. Okay, but yeah. my my read on the situation is that again it's it's multiple causations and it's probably not really at all linked to these neonicotinoid okay. insecticides. If you use an insecticide as per the label you should not have these issues. Okay. So as far as what we can do, just, you know, don't kill honeybees when you see them. Just, I mean, if you know that your neighbor has hives close, just kind of coordinate with him or her and yeah. say, look, I need to do a spray. Sure. Can you time the spray to not coincide with their active flight yeah. time of the okay. day? It's just, just common sense. Being a good neighbor, yeah. um, you know, planting wildflowers as well, just pollination sources make make your area more enticing for honeybees just anything you could do to help them out and that there's a state in or the state of virginia i should say has a program now hmm. 
I think it's, what did they allocate, like half a million dollars or quarter million dollars to actually supply people with on a first-come, first-served basis with honeybee hives oh, wow. to try and boost these these numbers. That's pretty and, cool. and they've been rebounding yeah. of late. Okay, yeah. You know, even in the absence of an outright ban on like these neonicotinoid yeah. insecticides, they've been rebounding. So it might be some other, you know, factor in the environment unbeknownst to us species kind of undulate right in terms yeah. of their of their numbers so we might have just happened to have been in a little bit of a <laughs> of a depression yeah so to speak sure. but now they're on the upswing again yeah very cool and yeah. i think what you said being a good neighbor that kind of <clears throat> applies to everything not be a species. good steward yeah. <laughs> in general and yeah. that's that's what farmers are that's what homeowners i think aspire to be as well yeah absolutely yep Well, thanks so much for joining me, man. This is awesome. Thank you. This was fantastic. I appreciate it. Yeah. Enjoy your last few days in DCC. (laughs) You as well. (laughs) We're in the same boat. Yep. Take care. See you later. Thanks for listening, everybody. You can find us on Facebook at Insights of All Trades. Find us on Instagram at Insights of All Trades. Twitter is IOAT Podcast. And send us your insights via email at insightsofalltrades at gmail.com. You can also DM us if you have some insights, and we'll include you at the beginning of the podcast. Thanks again. See you soon.